that in, uh, in Guyana they actually coat the barrels of molasses on the inside, which prevents angel share, uh, which is essentially the loss of alcohol over time. But that also allows you to extract extra vanillins thanks to the wood distillation. And vanillins are what all aged spirits get their flavor from. Alcohol essentially goes into wood, breaks down a couple chemical compounds, and comes back out, literally changed to more flavor. And so thanks in large part to the process, we're allowed to have this, I feel like I'm taking credit for this right now, you're allowed to make a very delicious rum uh, in, in, I say, guess a large scale, but also at a very decent cost. Um, to be honest, another cool thing about this still, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but they have to replace, I think it's every nine months, they have to replace panels on this. So it's kind of a cool thing, and it's, it's historically been producing rum for ages, but it's kind of also new. Every time you replace a wooden stave or a, wooden, a piece of the still, it essentially keeps 90% of the spirit the same, but it has a little bit different every single year, which I think is really cool from a rum point of view. Uh, I mean, it's not, I can't say much more than that. That's tasty still. Next slide. So one of the other cool things, and I'm sure you all know about this as well, is that everyone very much supporting eco-friendly uh, production these days. And one of the things that we thought was cool about the distillery, and one of the reasons aside from the high quality of rum that we decided to uh, bring this stuff in, was the fact that when they ferment the molasses, um, you're all gonna nod your heads because you already know this, but when they ferment the molasses in Guyana, they actually carbon capture all the gas that comes off the fermentation, and that goes to a local soda plant. So I think it's Pepsi Cola. I've never been to Guyana, but if any of you want to take me, I'll have to come see Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that a Pepsi? <laughs> I think it's Coke. Yes. Pepsi, or two a soda company. Um, so that's kind of another, I guess you call it arrow in the quiver yeah. for selling this. Um, but ultimately, what, what's been really great about this is to bartenders and consumers alike, we can say that this is 100% Demerara. People know about the history, the naval history, the, the, uh, the links to the vice of the British colonies, which is kind of a touchy subject. Um, but it allows us to make I suppose you could say bartender friendly drinks, but also the kind of thing you can just give to the recipe here. They don't need to be overly complicated. This, if you've never had a daiquiri before, daiquiris are the best drink, potentially ever. Next to neat rum, obviously. Um, but thanks to the quality of this rum, you can literally make drinks as simple as a double measure of this with a bit of lime and sugar and just shake it. Shake it as hard as you can, double strain it, and throw it out, they're delicious. Um, and yeah, Am I missing anything? I feel like it's just, it's a really good product that allows us to, to sell to everybody, really. Um, I feel like there's a lot of blank faces right now. Awesome <laughs> Do you guys have any questions about who we market it to or how I many? It's, it's, it basically sells itself pleasantly, but it makes my job very easy. Um, Can you go down and see your place drinking? Absolutely. Oh, and also, if you're looking for this stuff, sorry, I shouldn't have been on the first slide. Down here. So our company is only five years old. We bring this stuff in, like I said, it's not blended. It's 100% Guyanese. The more places we get into, the more you'll see it. But down here are a few places you can get it at. The easiest thing I think right now would be Whiskey Exchange Online. It should be around 20 something quid, uh, depending on where you buy it. But if I do my job well, you'll see it in more and more places across London over the years. Let's go up front first, and then the back. So you've had water to it, so it's yes. not truly yeah. Demerara, is it? Because it's actually Demerara and well, by law, you don't actually have to say where you proof things down. Uh, we buy it in at 57.5%, which is essentially barrel proof. Yeah. Uh, and then I don't know if you guys know the UK tax laws. Basically, two thirds of every bottle of spirit you buy is tax. Um, and once you go above 40%, which is like considered the industry standard, the tax jumps incrementally. So 40% is pretty much considered the industry standard. It allows us to sell it at a reasonable price. We do, however, have a navy strength, which is just 57.5%. The horse in the front, you'll notice that the horse in the front will have a skeleton on it. That's a new thing. That'll be out soon. I think even more delicious. But I like drinking spirits. Um, but we, we essentially don't do anything to it to change the flavor or the terroir of the spirit itself. So literally, other than we get it in, we pump in and reverse osmosis water, and then we bottle it, and nothing else happens to it. Um, but we try to be as transparent about everything that we do. So. If that law changes and we can no longer call it Demerara, then we'll call it yeah, Guyanese blend. But it's just fantastic stuff. So we're not we're not pretending to make it. We're hopefully not. We're not trying to take credit for it. I mean, if you want to give me credit, I'll have to take it. <laughs> this guy was up next. I'll come over to you.
Yeah, well, the reason we sit on the Navy strength is we're at home. Several reasons. One, we're a really small company and we have no money. So we thought, let's get one rum that you can sip and eat. You can also mix with. Like, it's never going to replace Eldorado 15. Like, if you want to sip a rum over ice, do that. Or 24, if you can get your hands on it. Or the 24 Madeira cask. It's delicious. Um, we may in the future, if we're successful and we get, I don't know, a lot more money somehow by continuing selling, we may expand the portfolio, but really that rum kind of has all the characteristics we need to basically sell it to bars and sell it to consumers. And I think the price is pretty affordable too, considering what, where we get it from. Over here? Yeah, um, I just wanted to know what made you decide to go into Vermont and Incredible pedigree from Diamond Distilleries. I mean, I think their master blender won a lifetime contribution to rum, which I don't know how you get that award or who gives it out or how you earn it or what it means. But she is essentially insanely good at her job. And really, they were insanely friendly. When we were looking at a shipping over molasses or sugarcane or even sugarcane juice from French colonies and inoculating it and shipping over to reduce price, all a humongous pain. Uh, and they were like, oh, if you're looking for rum, we could probably make you a blend somewhere around what you're looking for, just come out and have a, have a taste. So that guy in the middle, Alex, whose life is really difficult, he got to go out to Guyana. And basically, they were, they were just incredibly helpful and incredibly friendly, and they had everything that we wanted. And also, like I said, Demerara has got such a pedigree in, especially London bar scene, I can't really speak for Canada or America, because I've never really been working in either of those places. Um, but the pedigree was good, they were really friendly, and the price was good, and the product is, I think, insane. So. That was, that's why I went with Demerara. And then while I said that, I forgot the second part of your question. Um, do you actually do anything with the local diamonds? I mean, if you take the rum is coming from diamonds, do you actually do any business with the locals? Uh, like, we don't. Here in the UK? No, in, in Guyana. No, no, our, our involvement in Guyana was literally sending Alex over to find a blend. And then they, they now blend it for us and ship it over. Yes. Uh, we would love to. But we're not like Diageo or Pernod. So until we get more money to expand outside of London, that's probably going to be going to be it. To give you an example of, of how small of a company we are, I started on as the bartender. I opened up the venue. I used to run the bar, and then Alex and Tom tricked me into going out and talking about spirits because I really mm -hmm. love spirits. And now I'm a global brand ambassador. <laughs> so I was like the whole sales team and the bar guy and the events guy. So, soon. Actually, my real answer is yes. I'm gonna press my boss. He's gonna send me out to Guyana. Got a whole initiative plan. It's mostly to do with me traveling out there. Watch the space. <laughs> um, again, not at the moment, but hopefully, yes, in the future. Because we are, I mean, we are proud to have this as our. You might not come back. That's also my plan. I mean, <laughs> not that I don't like London. But yes. Well, so the, I believe the wood that it's made out of is called lignum vitae. It's one of the hardest woods uh, in the world that I'm aware of. So it's, it's this. It's not green heart. It might, I think that's just the last one. We, we know it's green heart. Green heart. It's green heart wood. Um, a, you can only really grow wood like that in tropical and subtropical climates. And B, the cost to keep it up and running is higher than it is for, let's say, copper or stainless steel. Uh, and so I think when Vanna nationalized rum production, whoever was using that obviously was lucky. There have been others. I know there's one in Australia that only works for wine, and that worked about twice, as far as I'm aware. And there was one in California up until 2012, running for two years. But you really need a human environment to keep the wood from, actually it's weird to say this, because you keep the wood and it keeps it from getting moldy. Um, but you also just need to have people who know what they're doing. And obviously, DDL have been using it for ages, and they inherited it, so they know the entire process. And the guy I know who had a wooden column still in California ran it twice and was like, I don't know why it's not working anymore. It's lost pressure. It was then got moldy. So I think it's a combination of having the expertise, but also, I don't know, being, being lucky, I suppose, and having good wood. If that makes sense? Yeah. Anybody else? Have you been to Canada? Not yet. Okay. I'm hoping after this, you'll all go away and be like, well, that guy Mike was great. Let's tell Alex's boss he needs to go out there and see how, 
see how that works. I know, we put the we put the name Global on it. I feel like I need travel more to make that real. I know we're tasting at your place. Oh, so uh, if you want to come around to our place, so in front of this, so these are our stills back here that makes up whiskey on the left, gin on the right. In front of that is a large glass wall, and then beyond that is a bar and a restaurant. So if you wanted to swing by, we're open six days of the week, not Mondays anymore. Uh, you can come in, watch stuff being made, sip stuff over the bar. We do also operate tours, which we just hired a tour manager for. That's all through our website. The really long East London Liquor Company dot com. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll obviously pass out tasters here, or you can just swing by and say hello, and we'll have. We usually have it. We always have it. If we ever run out of them, we're in trouble. So come out and. Where is it? Oh. So we're in Bow Wharf. So if you know, it's way out east. So like Mile End or Bethnal Green. Uh, it's just on the tail end of Victoria Park. If you Google us, we're now actually on the maps. We're probably updated. It's not too hard to find us. Uh, you'll want, all of you, if it's your first time, you're going to come up to the thing that says Bow Wharf, and you're going to say, this looks like a car park, and there's a gym. We're actually in that car park, just next to the gym. It gets really pretty, but you have to walk in and then left. Otherwise, it just looks like a car park, which is the hipsterest thing ever, I think, to have a cool bar in a car park. Sorry. I know a little bit about rum. Uh, I know a little bit about rum. Good. Um, in the olden days, we used to buy from the, the, um, the sugar estate, mm. their high wine, and then you could pour that high wine into rum. And so, the high wine is overproof. I love high wine. That's amazing. Um, I think you still have to buy high wine, but maybe. So the, the laws, depending on where you are, and I mean, for example, India has absolutely no laws, and they produce, I think they're the biggest producers of rum in the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. You don't have to buy high wines, especially now if you're not doing a blend. So I was, I was actually talking to somebody just earlier about the fact that um, not too long ago, prestige rums were considered blends, and they used to have a lot more rules about what you needed to buy and what you needed to mix in to call it a rum. Uh, but thanks, I think, in large part, to honestly El Dorado and creating El Dorado 18 in the premium rum category, people now care more about where rum is from and the terroir of the park than they do about the blends. So I, as far as I know, you don't need to buy high wines at all anymore. Uh, you can. And I think you can blend stuff through a blending house in Amsterdam if you want to, but we don't. We just buy distilled sugar cane, well, so molasses, sorry, barrel aged and shipped over. Do you know that Diana has earned a lot of medals? One yes. wife with, with, with their rum. Yeah, I mean, Diamond's been producing fantastic stuff for a load of companies forever, but uh, El Dorado really quite quite quantitatively changed the way people interact with rum these days. Before 15, you would never see any statements on rum. You would rarely ever see it like being proud of the country of this rum. Like I said, it would be fun lens for a long time. So, very aware that Guyana has literally, I don't know, what's the coolest term now? Flip the script, change the game. Let's go change the game. Guy has literally changed the game for Rome. So I am aware. I feel like I would be made more aware if I'm traveling to Guyana. I feel like that's one of the recurring themes of my chat today. <laughs> if you take away anything, it's that I should go to Guyana. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Um, you may not have thought along these lines, but have you discussed with Demerara Rum or the Demerara supplier the actual patenting of Demerara rum, because we have an issue with Demerara sugar, is that yes. it having not been patented, effectively it means that Demerara sugar now is produced <coughs> in Mauritius. And if you think in terms of it's the marketing principle, most establishments stock two rums currently, Captain Morgan and Bacardi. So any place you go into, you will find that those two rums are on the shelf. If you patent Demerara rum or the company in Guyana patents that name, it gives you a lot more weight in terms of you know, establishing your brand. So as far as I'm aware, um, this is, we had to look into the EU regulations before we actually made the labels for our bottle. Uh, if you want to call your product a Demerara rum, you have to buy at least some of your rum from Guyana. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily like an AOC in the same way that like tequila or brandy is. Uh, I think it should be, since all the fan comes from the river and the sugar cane and the rum. So I think it should be. Um, that's not something we can necessarily push. We can support it, but we can't really file for that to be a protected, what do they call it? Uh, patent. A patent. patent or a, what's the 
French town. It doesn't matter. We, we can't actually make that happen. Um, but in at least... I mean like the appellation in wines. Yes. Appellation controle. In the alcohol industry, more often than not now, though, people will, if they say they're Marrera and it's still a blend, it'll probably be an older, older product. Um, but people are caring a lot more about sort of the provenance and the terroir of rum. So you'll see people like uh, Plantation or Foursquare or uh, there's a few different blending houses now that are becoming quite famous. And they will, if it's 100% if it's Guyanese, they will say Demerara. And people tend not to now. It should totally be a protective thing, but we don't have too much power enacting that. But we will totally help. If, if anybody asks, our vote is yes. Yeah, I just had one question about, in terms of using Guyana as part of the story, so do you use that in your marketing? Absolutely. And what, and what, I mean, are you finding that that's what helps to sell it? Like, how do you tell the story in order to make people interested in the fact that it's from Guyana? With, with consumers, it's pretty easy, because uh, they know Demerara is, is a known term. Mm -hmm. And so once you tell them what it means, then it sort of clicks, and they kind of put together the things, and it becomes... Like, a, like an entity of itself. Um, in the industry, like so to, to bartenders or to other spirit professionals, uh, it's also pretty easy because everyone knows Guyana, like everything that ever comes from Guyana, and DDL is an amazing distillery. So we always talk about the fact that we don't make it, but we never pretend that we make ELLC's Demerara. Rum says on the bottle comes from Guyana, 100% Guyanese. Um, and the fact that we only use the Enmore still is for spirits geeks, it's a really huge talking point. So if, for example, if I go to a trade show and we talk about our gin, we have this whole story about these three idiots and what we do. But when it comes to the rum, it's always, the narrative is always, we get this from and here's why, here's how good it is, go. So it is literally part of our, I hate to say marketing strategy, because we're not really big enough or cool enough to have like a whole team, but it is part of our marketing strategy, if that makes sense, really? like all the time. Right. Is your rum 100% Demerara rum? Yes, except for the water that we proof it down with. But all the rum is yes, from here. Yeah. Yeah. Did you talk about it? I didn't see 100%. Oh, that's easy. Yeah. Uh, is that it? Any more questions? Uh, you placed it in quite a, you know, quite a well known uh, spirit establishments there. Yes. Do you find it difficult to place it? Uh, no, not really, to be honest. The, with, with the rum, Although we don't put an age statement on it, which we do to kind of make it accessible to consumers, it's it's quite literally, I'll walk up and we'll say, taste it, and they go, this is great. And then we tell them the price, and they buy it. It's, yeah, it's, it's we have a much easier job than, say, Catherine Morgan's and Cardi are part of a larger portfolio, because yeah. we're, we're not really the big spirits brand. We just like the rums we bring it in. So, so far, I don't want to jinx myself, it's been a case of taste it. If you like it, buy it. If you don't, don't. And it's been really easy so far. So why not supermarket? Because they are so difficult to get into. If you want to be in any supermarket, you essentially have to pay like 20 grand up front for them to stock your product. Then you have to support them with time to like be in the stores and do tastings. And we just don't have the money right now. Uh, we are in Whole Foods because they like to work locally. So you can find all of them and check the Whole Foods on here. But they're not everywhere. But places like Tesco's and Sainsbury's and Waitrose, we're talking to everyone. But it really is have to know the right people and then just keep having them. So we'll get there eventually, I hope. But yeah, it's 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 just more a lot more difficult to, to get into supermarkets than any of us thought. Okay. Cool. Thank you everybody. Thank you.